Hey guys, gals, lizard folk, any anybody out there living in the woods, in the dark of the night, living in the shadows, or out in the sun, that's okay. You're all welcome to listen to my stories. And this week, I'm not going to make up a story. Actually, I'm kind of sort of going to make up a story. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a story. And then while I'm reading the story, when I start to get bored, I'm just going to sort of make it up as I go along. I'm going to change the story and make up the ending. And this is not a story for little little boys, little girls. This is this is mostly a story for mom and dad. Now now the kids the kids can listen. I mean it's safe for kids. They might be interested, but then they might not be interested. But I, I hope I hope that the the kid that the the kids' parents would be interested. And mostly the whole point of my reading and then making up a story I, as I get bored is is for everybody to fall asleep. That's why they're called bedtime stories. <laughs> it's for you to sleep, not for you to pay attention to my stories. You're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to listen to my voice, and as you listen to my voice, your eyes get heavy, and your breathing slows down, and you breathe in, and you breathe out, and you breathe in again. And you breathe out, and you start to get really relaxed. And then you don't pay attention to my stories anymore, and then you fall asleep, which is what the whole point. And I hope that you get a good night's sleep. And don't worry, none of the stories that I read, I mean, the stories that I make up, I just make up, but the stories that I read are not going to give you nightmares. They're supposed to actually not give you anything, just make, just make you to sleep. And that's what I'm going to do right now. I'm going to read a story. And I'm not, even, I'm not even going to tell you what the story is. I'm just going to start reading. And as I start reading, I'm just going to start making stuff up while I read. So that's not really a good way to tell a story. You're supposed to read the story out loud for people. But I kind of I kind of have trouble focusing on things and, and, and paying attention to things. And my, my mind starts to wander and my attention gets gets a hold of me. And I can't really control it. It just kind of goes where it wants to go. But don't worry. It always goes to a safe place. Not a scary place. My mind's not like that. No. Because I'm Uncle Jaja. Here to tell you a story. And I'm going to begin the story with time. That's right. At 9.30, Jim and Clark met in front of Soda Sam's and started for the country club in Clark's Ford. Jim asked Clark casually as they rattled through the jasmine-scented night, how do you keep alive? The jelly bean paused, considered. Well, he said finally, I've got a room over Tilly's garage. I help him some with the cars in the afternoon, and he gives it, it to, and he gives it to me for free. Sometimes I drive one of his taxis and pick up a little right away. I get fed up doing that regular, though. That all? Well, when there's a lot of work, I help him by the day, Saturdays usually, and then there's one main source of revenue I don't generally mention. Maybe you don't recollect I'm about the champion crap shooter of this town. They make me shoot from a cup now, because once I get the feel of a pair of dice, they just roll for me. Clark grinned appreciatively. I never could learn to set them so they'd do what I wanted. Wish you'd shoot with Lancia Lamar someday and take all our money away from her. She will roll them with the boys and she loses more than her daddy can give her, can afford to give her. I happen to know she sold a good ring last month to pay a debt. The jelly bean was non-committal. The White House on Elm Street still belong to you? Jim shook his head. 
sold, got a pretty good price, seeing that it wasn't in a good part of town no more. Lawyer told me to put it into Liberty Bonds, but Aunt Mammy got so she didn't have no sense, so it takes all the interest to keep her up at Great Farm Sanitarium. Hmm. I got an old uncle upstate, and I reckon I can go up there if ever I get sure enough poor. Nice farm, but not enough people around to work it. He's asked me to come up and help him, but I guess, I don't guess I'd take too much to it. Too gone, doggone lonesome. He broke off suddenly. Clark, I want to tell you I'm much obliged to ask you for, I'm much obliged to you for asking me, asking me out, but I'd be a lot happier if you just stopped the car right here and let me walk back into town. Shucks, Clark grunted. Do you get to step out? You don't have to dance? Just get out there on the floor and shake. Hold on, exclaimed Jim uneasily. Don't you go leading me up to any girls and leaving me there so I'll have to dance with them. Clark laughed. Cuz, Jim, cuz, continued Jim desperately. Without you, swear you won't uh, do that. I'm going to get right out of here and my good legs are going to carry me back to Jackson Street. They agreed after some argument that Jim, unmolested by females, was to view the spectacle from a secluded setting in the corner where Jim would join him whenever he wasn't dancing. Who doesn't like to dance? Really? Who doesn't like to dance? By the way, this is me talking, not the story. I just like, uh, if I hear some music, I can't help myself. My toes, my toes like to tap, tap, tap. Sometimes both my toes, because I only have two toes. Because I'm wearing shoes. And shoes, think about it. Think about it. Shoes basically are one big toe covering your foot. So it's like your foot is really just one big toe. So because I have two feet, it's like I have two toes. So I'm just tapping two toes. That makes sense. So 10 o'clock found that jelly bean with his legs crossed and his arms conservatively folded, trying to look casually at home and politely uninterested in the dancers. At heart, at heart, he was torn between overwhelming self-consciousness and an intense curiosity as to all that went on around him. He saw the girls emerge one by one from the dressing room, stretching and pluming themselves like bright birds, smiling over their powdered shoulders at the chaperones, casting a quick glance around to take in the room, and simultaneously the room's reaction to their entrance. And then, again like birds, alighting and nestling in the sober arms of their waiting escorts. Sally Carol Hopper, a blonde and lazy-eyed, appeared clad in her favorite pink and blinking like an awakened rose. Marjorie Haight, Marilyn Wade, Harriet Carey, all the girls he had seen loitering down Jackson Street by noon, now curled and brilliantined and delicately tinted for the overhead lights, were miraculously strange Dresden figures of pink and blue and red and gold, fresh from the shop and not yet fully dried. He had been there half an hour, totally uncheered by Clark's jovial visage, which were each one accompanied by a hello, old boy, how you making out, and a slap at his knee. A dozen males had spoken to him or stopped for a moment beside him, but he knew that they were each one surprised at finding him there and fancied that one or two were even slightly resentful. But at half past ten, his embarrassment suddenly left him in a pull of brother's interest took him completely out of himself. Nancy Lamar had come out of the dressing room. She was dressed in a yellow organdy, a costume of a hundred cool corners, with three tiers of ruffles and a big bow in back until she shed black and yellow uh, around her in a sort of phosphorescent luster. The jelly bean's eyes opened wide and a lump arose in his throat, for she stood beside the door until her partner hurried up. Jim recognized him as the stranger who had been with her in jo Joe Ewing's car that afternoon. He saw her set her arms akimbo and say something in a low voice and laugh. The man laughed too, and Jim experienced a quick pang of a weird new kind of pain. Some ray had passed between the pair, a shaft of beauty from that sun, and that warmed him a moment since. The jelly bean felt suddenly like a reed in a shadow. A minute later, Clark approached him, bright-eyed and glowing. Hi, old man, he cried with some lack of origin originality. How are you making out? Jim replied that he was making out as well as could be expected. 
You come along with me, Commander Clark. I've got something that'll put an edge on the evening. Jim followed him awkwardly across the floor and up the stairs to the locker room, where Clark produced a flask of nameless yellow liquid. Good old corn. Ginger ale arrived on a tray, so such potent nectar as good old corn needed some disguise beyond seltzer. Sad boy, exclaimed Clark breathlessly. Doesn't Nancy Lamar look beautiful? Jim nodded. Mighty beautiful, he agreed. She's all dolled up to a fair year all tonight, continued Clark. Notice that fellow she's with? Big fellow, white pants? Yeah. Well, that's Ogden Merritt from Savannah. Old man Merritt makes the Merritt safety razors. This fella's crazy about her. Been chasing after her all year. She's a wild baby, continued Clark, but I like her. So does everybody. But she sure does do crazy stunts. She usually gets out alive, but she's got scars all over her reputation from one thing or another she's done. That's so... Jim passed over his glass. That's good corn. Not so bad. Oh, she's a wild one. She's crops, say, boy. And she do like her highballs. Promise I'd give her one later on. She in love with this merit? And darned if I know, it seems like all the best girls around here are merry fellows and go off somewhere. He poured himself one more drink and carefully corked the bottle. I gotta go dance, and I'd be much obliged if you just stick this corn right on your hip as long as you're not dancing. If a man notices I've had a drink, he'll come up and ask me, and before I know it, it's all gone and somebody else is having my good time. So Nancy Lamar was going to marry. This toast of a town was to become the private property of an individual in white trousers, and all because white trousers' father had made a better razor than his, na razor than his neighbor. As it descended the stairs, Jim found the idea inexplicably depressing. For the first time in his life, he felt a vague and romantic yearning. A picture of her began to form in his imagination. Nancy walking boylike in debonair along the street, taking an orange as tithe from a worshipful fruit dealer, charging a dope on a mythical account as Soda Sam's, assembling a convoy of bow and then driving off in a triumphal state of an afternoon of splashing and singing. The jelly bean walked out on the porch to a deserted corner, dark between the moon on the lawn and the single lighted door of the ballroom. There he found a chair and lighting a cigarette drifted into the thoughtless reverie that was his usual mood. Yet now is a reverie made sensuous by the night and by the hot smell of damp powder puffs tucked in the front in the fronts of low dresses and distilling a thousand rich scents to float out through the open window, open door, sorry, to float out through the open door. The music itself, blurred by a loud trombone, became hot and shadowy, a languorous overtone to the scraping of many shoes and slippers. Suddenly the square of yellow light that fell through the door is obscured by a dark figure. A girl had come out of the dressing room and was standing on the porch not more than ten feet away. Jim heard a low breed dog gone, and then she turned and saw him. It was Nancy Lamar. Jim rose to his feet. Howdy? Hello, she paused, hesitated, then approached. Oh, it's Jim Powell. He bowed slightly, tried to think of a casual remark. Do you suppose she being... She began quickly. I mean, do you know anything about gum? And he said, yeah. I know all about gum. I've got chewing gum. Do you want some chewing gum? And she was like, depends what kind of chewing gum. Well, there's Starburst. I guess that's not a gum. That's like a chewy candy. And then there's Wrigley's gum. Do they still make Wrigley's gum? I guess, you know, when I was growing up, the only flavor you could get was uh, spearmint. 
By the way, what is spearmint? I don't even know what spearmint is. Is, is don't you just call it a mint? Don't you have a mint? Like what is a spearmint? It's just mint. I don't know. What's going on with that? Um, I know bazooka gum. Bazooka is the kind that comes with like a sticker. And then uh, Topps baseball cards used to come with gum. So you'd open up the, the foil wrap and you'd pull out your baseball card. And I didn't really care about that. But for a while, they did this with Star Wars cards. That was really the bomb. And... You know, it also had gum and I just tossed the gum because half the time it was like really old and crusty and just crumpled like cardboard. Uh, and I don't care. I don't care. Because uh, I had my, I had my, you know, Chewbacca card. I remember that. I had my uh, Luke Skywalker card. So you could get two Luke Skywalker cards. You could get the Luke Skywalker card when he's in the awards ceremony. And he was wearing his yellow jacket. That was pretty cool. Uh, or you could um, get uh, the card when he was in his X-Wing orange jumpsuit. Uh, his flight suit. I guess it's not a jumpsuit. It's a flight suit. That was pretty cool. Uh, do they still make blackjack? Blackjack gum? Man. Blackjack gum was actually a really pretty good gum. And and it was even, I even really super liked it because it was popular during World War II. And in the early 80s, uh, American TV did this uh, sort of resurgence. Resurgence of World War II themed things. So there'd be TV shows that would be like period shows about World War II or uh, TV dramas would always have like a flashback to World War II for like several episodes or something like that. That was a pretty good time. Not World War II because that kind of sucked. But the, um, the, the early 80s where, the, you know, the World War II stuff was like really super in. And that was... And then, and so the reason why I bring up blackjack is because in those shows they would talk about, you know, hey, buddy, can I have some blackjack uh, gum? Or, hey, would you like to have a piece of my blackjack gum? And I'd look around and they still sold blackjack gum. And I'd be like, oh, this is cool. This is like World War II, you know? And actually, it's kind of good. It's kind of good. But you don't know this because hopefully you're asleep. Hopefully you're asleep if you're reading this. And if you're not reading this, of course not you're reading this, you're listening to this. That's that's really, that's silly. That's very silly. How can you read this if it's if it's a podcast? But, but you could be watching this. You could. It is a video where I show, I show the, um, the, the, the pictures that I use to make up my stories. But I'm not showing pictures because I'm reading a story. But somewhere along the story, I got bored and I just started making up, you know, stuff that happened. Sort of like when I'm talking about gum. Oh, yeah, that, oh, that's right. I need to talk about gum. Um, so so this guy, Jim, uh, is going to sell Nancy Lamar some gum. And he says, hey, I'll give you a piece of my, a stick, because that's what you call a piece of gum, a stick. I'll give you a stick of my uh, fruit roll-up gum. Uh, which one do you want? Do you want banana, cotton candy, or a uh, cherry tomato? And uh, Nancy Lamar said, ew, cherry tomato? No way, that's gross. And he said, well, I lied don't have banana and I don't have cotton candy I only have cherry she said I have a cherry tomato he said ha 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 he didn't let me finish you can only have cherry tomato but actually he said here she says what no this is Wrigley gum this is Wrigley gum and it's spearmint it's my favorite and he said oh I know I know I was just joshing ya <laughs> I'm just a jokester 
I would give you cherry tomato gum. That's gross. Ew. And she's like, oh, man, that's, that's a funny joke. That's a really funny joke. So then they were talking about, you know, their favorite gum flavors. And uh, and then uh, and then let's Nancy Lamar's boyfriend came out and he saw she was with Jim and he was like super jealous. He said, what are you doing with my girlfriend? And Jim says, oh, well, I gave her some gum. And then the boyfriend is, oh, OK, no, that's, that's, that's OK. Do you have any gum, too? Because I'd really like some gum. And Jim said, sure. Uh, but if only if you promise to be my friend. And uh, Nancy Lamar's boyfriend, I forgot his name already. Uh, he had a name, but I forgot what it was. Um, but anyway, um, he, they became friends. And so they sat together uh, chewing gum and talking about their favorite gum flavors. And uh, and then and then uh, uh, so one of them looked at uh, their uh, their phone uh, and and saw what time it was. I don't know. I don't know if they have smartphones in this story. Uh, I don't know. This is a story written by uh, F. Scott Fitzgerald. I'm pretty sure he had a smartphone, so he could see what time it was. So anyway, one of one of them, uh, Jim or Nancy Lamar or Nancy Lamar's boyfriend, who's also Jim's new friend. So they're all friends now. Um, it looked, and one of them looked at the front and said, oh no, it's getting really late. It's getting really late. It's like 7.30, 7.30, oh, and I gotta go to bed. So, um, so they were like, okay, let's go. And they left and then they um, took the bus that brought them back downtown. And then Jim went uh, and slept in a box because I guess he lives he lives in a box next to a car parts store I guess, uh, but it's, I, he was happy there so that's fine it's cool whatever I mean it, he sleeps in a box inside the uh, car parts store. And then Nancy Lamar went to her home, and she watched reruns of the Gilmore Girls. While she was chewing gum, and then Nancy Lamar, Lamar's boyfriend went home, and he played a little bit of Minecraft, not too much, not too much Minecraft, and then he swallowed his gum. And that's not good because you know what happens when you swallow your gum; it stays inside you for seven years. That's a true story. I once had a friend who swallowed gum when he was seven years old, and now he's like 67, and the gum's still there, and it grew a gum tree inside him. That is, and it's real. Because he said so. He told me. But you don't know that because you're asleep. And with that, I'm going to say this is the end of my story. And that is how I'm going to stop for tonight and say to you, good night. Good night.